Sorry, Malimu, I needed to do that first uh, before I give you the rights. Okay, okay. So I will soon give you the rights. Let me make a few some holes, then I can. So, Malim, you're, you're good to go. Yes, Should you yes, want absolutely. other people to to um share, you'll activate all, all, all participants right. because I think I did that before I, I I made you the host. So wish you well. I'll be recording and I'll be online. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Wish thank you well. You. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Arian. Thank you. It's a pleasure too. So, plus, how are you this evening? We are good. We are good. Thank you. Just trying to share my screen. Right. So this evening we meet again and um, as i had indicated last week we hope that uh, this would be our final class for this uh, course um, i'm hoping that uh, by the end of this evening today we should have quite taken in something that can benefit us in our understanding of issues of policy and practice. So today evening, we would like to look at um, the last topic in my consideration, looking at critical thinking and the skills involved in critical thinking. Our focus this evening on critical thinking will take us through about four items. So our key learning points with regard to critical thinking skills will be to seek to deepen, widen, and strengthen our ongoing learning and understanding of one, what critical thinking is, two, to understand the importance, the rationale for critical thinking, the justification for critical thinking in our schools, in our lives. Thirdly, to look at the relevance of critical thinking in education. So you notice that one will be dealt with very closely with the number two, the rationale, the importance of critical thinking. And then finally, to be able to look at the strategies that can be involved in teaching critical thinking, how, how to really teach uh, enhance critical thinking in our learners, even those who do not have the teaching background, we always say it's always a pleasure to appreciate this. I'll be talking, indicating that even when we are involved in institutional and organizational uh, leadership, the people we talk to, the people we lead and so forth, the people we work with, will appreciate within this class that is important to enhance critical thinking. It will be for the good of the existence of those organizations and institutions. So we like to begin our first consideration by discussing the concept of critical thinking, 
which is uh, occasionally also referred to as analytic thinking. The concept of critical thinking, occasionally referred to as analytic thinking. Now, generally in our lives uh, where we walk, where we work, in our families, in our schools, in our institutions, it is not quite uncommon to hear people talk about good thinking as contrasted from what they call bad thinking. Now, good thinking is often indicated and demanded when one is thinking well. See, people will talk about good thinking. On the converse, bad thinking will very much often be reprimanded. So people would prefer good thinking. They will demand good thinking. They will praise good thinking and they will reprimand bad thinking. Now, Peter Fashon in 2013 distinguishes good thinking from bad thinking with bad thinking being responsible for all manner of human errors, both in thought and action. So Fashon looking at all this indicates that we can distinguish bad thinking from good thinking. And he indicates that bad thinking is responsible for all human errors, all manner of human errors, is responsible for all manner of bad action. So with that, Peter Fashon is trying to emphasize the importance of good thinking. However, Fashon emphasizes that good thinking is not synonymous with the critical thinking. Instead, he indicates that critical thinking must be understood as a subset of good thinking. For fashion, critical thinking is a subset of good thinking. So when you look at it uh, in that manner, fashion would want to believe that, or would want us to believe that critical thinking is, a, is to be understood to be one form of good thinking besides other forms. So that's what we mean by good thing, critical thinking being a subset of good thinking. It's as if to say there are other forms of good thinking besides critical thinking. And indeed, Fashon mentions other forms would include what he refers to as creative thinking, innovative thinking, and so forth. So he's talking about all these other types. So he talks about creative thinking and uh, innovative thinking as examples of other forms of what we call really good thinking. Now, besides fashion, there are other thinkers like Paul and Elder who have contributed to this discussion. Thinkers like uh, Karakop 2016 who have contributed to this discussion. For instance, really from literature, Paul and Elder argue that critical thinking is about a process of assessing or judging, while creative thinking concerns a mastery over a process of making or producing. So for Elder and Paul, critical thinking is about assessing arguments, making decisions. So critical thinking is much more of assessing arguments. While creative thinking for Paul and Elder concerns itself with a mastery of a process of making or producing something. So it's the creative, we, we sometimes talk about the creative power of the mind. Now, though not the same, these two types of thinking, that is creative thinking and critical thinking are fundamentally inseparable they are always integrated together and more or less we can talk of them as being unitary. This indeed, in fact, uh, my dear friends, is the reason why critical thinking ought to be one of the most endorsed educational aims and ideals. 
In fact, is educational value for our learners, for our schools, is significant since it has the capacity to force and influence how we think and how we act. So much so that the way we operate, you see, we operate on the basis of how we are able to think critically. Sometimes we people say nobody can act above his thinking or her thinking. So critical thinking, therefore, remains exceedingly central in the process of a continuous individual development and the self-fulfillment. You remember, for those who are teachers by training, the third educational goal in Kenya is to ensure that people achieve that individual development and self-fulfillment. If that be the case, then we can be able to argue that critical thinking is one way through which we can be able to really achieve this. At this point, then, it will suffice to note that uh, no one is actually born a critical thinker. Nobody is born a critical thinker. And that no one, too, becomes really a critical thinker by chance. None of the features of critical thinking are inborn. Instead, we are affirming in this slide that it is a deliberate effort which is developed through the process of education. Critical education, critical thinking must be a deliberate effort. When you are a teacher in a school, you know, critical thinking will not just grow by itself in our learners. Critical thinking must involve a deliberate effort on our part as teachers. If you are talking about our learners, you must push those learners to the frontier of becoming critical thinkers. If indeed you are, for example, a, a head of a given institution, a CEO, whatever it is, working in an NGO, you realize from this discussion, it is always better to have those who work beside you become critical thinkers. And we are emphasizing they don't become critical thinkers by chance. We are emphasizing they are not born critical thinkers. Instead, critical thinking must be planted, must be developed through a deliberate educational process. That's really what we are uh, trying to emphasize on. Now, the quality of one's individual life and the extent of his or her fulfillment will largely depend on one's quality of thinking. That's really what I'm trying to emphasize. So we are saying the way one thinks, the way one decides, and the way one acts depends on the quality of that person's critical thinking. In other words, we can be able to say our decisions and actions, and even the general life in the society both proximate or remote, cannot escape the direct influence of our individual quality of thinking. What people do in the society, the society we live in, you know, the leaders we choose, the actions we encounter in our organizations, in our schools, whether those actions, whether those decisions be seen to be proximate or remote, those decisions and actions cannot escape the guess of the critical thinking levels of the people who work in these institutions. So, however, in spite of saying this, we are quick to say that this does not imply that critical thinking is a kind of a store, is a kind of a reservoir of fixed answers to life challenges. No, critical thinking is not a product it is not something that is produced and kept in our minds. Critical thinking is not to be seen as a store in our minds, which is a reservoir, a reservoir of teaching. So that what, what we are saying here and then, how do we understand, how do we look at critical thinking? We understand critical thinking as a disposition to suspend all judgments until all the prevailing reasons and options are adjudicated before the court of reason. So 
we are trying to develop in this slide our understanding of that concept, critical thinking. What is it? It is not a store of answers to our problems. It's not a reservoir of answers to our problems. Instead, it must be understood as a general rational disposition that somebody achieves so that he or she he, he or she is able to suspend all judgments until all the prevailing reasons and options are adjudicated before the court of reason. It does not mean that learners instructed in an educational program which is inclined towards critical thinking are normally given the answer to the solution to the challenges that they will face in life. No, it should be remembered at this point that today's problems and the challenges may not necessarily be replicated in the future lives or in the future adult lives of our learners. So we are saying therefore, the principles of critical education in any case rejects the supposition that we can pretend to teach learners to memorize the solutions to the problems they encounter. Nevertheless, as um, Ademi 2012 would rightly put it, daily and future success heavily depends on the quality of today's education. Therefore, this is the reason why we say critical thinking is one of those requisite educational tools that empowers a learner to become a very effective problem solver, regardless of his nature, time, and place. When we empower the learner in critical thinking skills, that learner is becoming tomorrow a citizen who will join the various facets of society. And as he joins those various facets of society, if he has critical thought, then he's able to contribute to his or her own life really profitably, profitably. So you understand really now what we mean by critical thinking. I don't know whether somebody would wish to have an observation at this point of simply understanding the concept. We'll later be moving to struggle to define what critical thinking now is. Here we are trying to put what critical thinking is in perspective. Anybody just in case? Doctor, I was what I was just wondering, listening to you. So yes. do people choose to think critically? Meaning that you might have the ability to think critically, but sometimes you ignore that and uh, do things that may turn out to be, you know, bad thinking. All right. Uh -huh. Perhaps before I respond to you, Nyabere, Helen, I see your hand up. Yes, Doctor. Um, my uh, just based on what Nyabere has said, um, and to add on to that, I would pose a question to want to know: Do we apply logic when we are doing critical thinking in or in most cases or in all cases? Because I tend to think you're saying that it's not something that we are born with, and it's something that um, it's just something that is developed with time. But I'm, I'm just wondering, is it in all cases that we apply the logic when we're doing critical thinking? All right, very well. Right, I think we, we try, we attempt to, to, to respond to what uh, Nyabere has brought up and, uh, and Helen. Now, Nyabere is asking us, is asking us in this class, do people choose? I, I put it, I put in my notes, do people choose not to think critically? In other words, do people have options to think critically or not to think critically? I think that's the question. And then uh, Helen adds to that, um, the application of logic, do we apply logic, how is critical thinking developed and so forth? I think Helen puts it correctly that uh, this is a follow-up. This is a follow-up to the first question. Now, my, my thinking is, you see, we have presented in this discussion a conception that uh, 
critical thinking is not a reservoir, is not a store of a store that is made up of nails, hammers, you know, jembe, you know, panga, stones, sticks, so that we would be able to say, do we choose this time to, to fasten the nail using a stone from this store? Or do we choose to use a hammer to fasten the nails or what? I would think no, in my, in my considered opinion. Critical thinking is a disposition. Sometimes, in fact, we, in fact, often, most of the time, we are not given to understand that we are critical thinkers. People around us would be able to say, ah, these are critical thinkers. People who have listened to us, you know, from time to time, they'll be able to recognize, ah, this is a critical thinker. Uh, one of my students, uh, asked me in class after sometimes uh, we've been learning, I was teaching them a course in philosophy. And uh, after we had taken some courses, he asked me, I still remember that, that dear sir, do you think I'm about to become a philosopher? See, I didn't tell, I didn't respond to say yes or no. Instead, I asked the student, do you think I'm a philosopher? And the student said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are a philosopher. And then I answered him, listen to the people around you. Continue to interrogate the thinking, the actions you are involved in. And I said, you never realize when you become a philosopher. I would say the same thing to critical thinking. Critical thinking is a disposition. Now, the issues, the activities, the steps involved in what we said that it is a deliberate effort. When we say it is a deliberate effort, you see, critical thinking is a deliberate effort, educational process to be aligned in a particular disposition. Those efforts are deliberate, but really the disposition itself, when it comes in, you start behaving in that disposition. So you see, our thinking will be good or bad depending on the level to which critical thinking is involved. But I can see some participants here. Maybe we listen to some of them. Waruku. Yes, Mwalimu, uh, my hand was up when you were asking for that. And indeed, part of what I wanted to ask you already moving into, because yeah. my concern was, uh, who really affirms that uh, this is a critical thinking. This level of thinking is critical thinking. And I also wanted to verify or validate from you if uh, 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 critical thinking is, uh, is, 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 is uh, contextual in that uh, a group that let me use the example i'm a fisherman and i every time i um, uh, have my holiday i'm around migingo i do fishing and uh, when you do for fishing you know that group of my fishing friends and all that you don't always find that uh, they, they really appreciate the thinking that uh, each and every one of them holds um but if you are a researcher from the university of nairobi or now Daystar, and you go there and you'll start wondering whether is, you start asking, is there somebody thinking? <laughs> so I just wanted to uh, get and appreciate that uh, there, uh, there are uh, con contexts to uh, the categorization and who really affirms. And uh, what would be the opposite of uh, uh, critical thinking? Uh, could, could we be... Uh, having mediocrity as part of this. So what 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 does it entail, actually? Thank you. Correct. Cindy, talk to us, Cindy. Yeah, Dr. Yes. Um. Yeah, you said that uh, you don't realize when you become a critical thinker, it's felt by others, yeah? So um, yes. my, my question is, does a critical thinker automatically become a creative person? Come again, come again. Does a creative, 
creative thinker automatically become a creative person? Yeah, in one of the slides, let's not uh, respond to that. In one of the slides, we will try to see the distinctions okay. between two concepts, critical thinking and creative thinking. So perhaps let us suspend that for that moment. Zipora. All right. Thank you so much, Doc. I just wanted to say that critical thinking thinking enables a person to analyze the, some information and make the right judgment. Right. Very well, Zipora. Taslin. Thank you, Dr. Tari. I just wanted to uh, try and answer some question that another student asked that if um, people choose to be critical thinkers or not, I would say that it can be both because if uh, critical thinking is something that's developed over time and it's a process and maybe it's done maybe through over time uh, specialization, then do you choose to use it or not? I can say yes. And sometimes also no, because sometimes um, when overcome by emotion, you might not be able to think critically and just make decisions in the spur of the moment. Thank you. Good. So well noted. So I think will be perhaps one of the issues that come up firmly is what Waruku indicated. And... Um, Waruku's question had to do with the contextual understanding or a placement of critical thinking. And indeed, as we proceed in this discussion this evening, you will notice critical thinking is not something that only happens in the mind. It must link thought and action. Critical thinking must link thought and action. If you like it, actually, we think critically in order to solve problem. A philosopher by the name John Dewey, an American philosopher, would put it that critical thinking is identified within the context of challenging or what he calls problematized situations. Therefore, critical thinking reveals itself, as Dewey would put it, in problematized situations. Therefore, critical thinking is not only exist, I mean, uh, contextual, but it is also existential, we would be able to say. Now, having said that, indeed, as I said, let's try to analyze what would be the essential distinction between critical thinking and the creativity. Put it, critical thinking and the creative thinking. You see? Now, you can see on the slide before us, critical thinking considered as the process we use to reflect on, assess, and judge the assumptions underlying our own and other ideas and efforts. So you see, critical thinking is a process that we kind of, as it were, use to reflect or if you like, to assess and to judge the assumptions that underlie our positions or positions of other people in terms of the ideas they hold and so forth. Now, when you look at the what we are calling creative thinking, creative thinking can be understood to be the process we use to develop ideas. You see, critical thinking, if you like, assesses, judges ideas, assesses, judges assumptions. Creative thinking develops ideas that are unique, that could be useful, could be worthwhile. So the critical distinction on that first level is critical thinking is a process of adjudicating positions, adjudicating our concepts of something, adjudicating what people think of something. Creative thinking, you can now get the feel, creativity, creativity. Creative thinking is about how we develop not only practical physical things, but how we develop new ideas, unique ideas. Critical thinking emphasizes on evaluating judgments, evaluating decisions. Creativity emphasizes on 
synthesizing them, you know, synthesize. And you synthesize in order to produce a new, greater idea. Put differently, critical thinking is linear and serial in structure. Critical thinking is more structured, is more rational, is more analytical. That's why we talk about analytic thinking as the other name for criti critical thinking. So critical thinking is more rational, is more analytical, is more goal-oriented, see? Creative thinking or creativity on the other hand is holistic, is not linear or serial. serial. It is parallel, is more emotional, is more intuitive. In fact, the word intuitive captures it more. You see, creative thinking is more of what the physicians would call, would refer to by Archimedes aha experience, that I've, I've found it, I've gotten it. It's more intuitive. I repeat the same word, it's more creative. You see, it is visualizing ideas, creating ideas. But you see, critical thinking is assessing the ideas that already, as it were, exist. So therefore, we are saying critical thinking generally involves analyzing a situation to determine potential problems. Critical thinking is actually a very critical tool in problem solving. On the other hand, creativity involves developing solutions for the problems. Now, there is no strict distinctions. You know, we are trying to say that one coin of solving problems, which side is the coin? The coin is made up of all those two sides. But if you turn this side, you don't see the other side. It is either the head or the tail. This is the relationship between what we are calling critical thinking and creativity or creative thinking. That's really the relationship. Now we look at the nature of critical thinking. We look at the nature of critical thinking. Now, generally, there are two constitute, constitutive principles that describe the essential nature of critical thinking. The first of these principles defines what we refer to as the normative nature of critical thinking. This normative nature is often referred to as the skill dimension. In other words, when Sigel 2010 refers to the normative nature as the skill dimension, he's simply saying, looking at critical thinking as a skill. You see, if you want to say critical thinking is important in problem solving, then you want to look at critical thinking as a skill. The term normative, to bring up the concept of what critical thinking ought to be. So normativity is the first constitutive, constitutive principle that defines the nature of critical thinking. The, the second one is what we refer to as the transformative effect. Sometimes I look at this as the functionality. So you are trying to ask, or rather tell yourself, two constitutive principles of critical thinking. The first constitutive principle is normativity, which says what critical thinking ought to be. Now, the second constitutive principle is the transformative element part of it. If you like, this is the functionality of critical thinking. So normativity, what it ought to be, transformative effect, what it does. These two components constitute the two principles that define the nature of critical thinking. We look at the first one, that is the normative nature, the skill dimension, as Sigel 2010 would put it. Now, for Peter Fashon 2013, uh, critical thinking 
would be seen to refer to the core cognitive abilities, the core cognitive abilities. So when you are talking about normativity, you are talking about what are the core cognitive abilities that define critical thinking? What ought to be the, 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 the dispositions that defines critical thinking? So the normative nature of critical thinking normally clarifies and defines what critical thinking as it were ought to be. For Norris, 1985, this principle defines critical thinking as an educational ideal which is founded on rationality. So that we are trying to say here with the Norris 1985, that there is that level of irreducible epistemic qualities epistemic to mean knowledge qualities, irreducible knowledge qualities, that for us to talk about critical thinking, this is the baseline. So dear students, here we are trying to proceed in this discussion, first of all, intellectually, and then we bring it now to bear on practical situations now. So we are struggling to understand the nature of critical thinking. The first nature, normativity, the normative nature. Norris is trying to say that this normativity defines critical thinking as an ideal which is based on rationality and a certain irreducible epistemic qualities. This is also uh, attested to by Ademi 2012. Now, Ademi contends that there are qualities or elements of rationality that constitute the framework within which any matter can be considered to be born out of critical thinking. So normative or the skill dimension of critical thinking generally consists of the core abilities such as interpretation, analysis, evaluation, and so forth. I think this must be coming up. I think I have this. Uh, maybe maybe just to get back to the previous slide, we come to that. So we are saying here, critical thinking generally, when we talk about the, the skills, the skills founded in critical thinking, there'll be skills like the ability to interpret, interpretation, skills like analysis, evaluation, inference, you know, explanation, and self-regulation. Peter Fashon has discussed quite in detail some of these things, some of these, 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 these skills and how they, they come to bear or they bring to bear the, the influence on what critical, th critical thinking is. So you notice, once more again to emphasize, critical, th I mean, critical thinking in the normative aspect, in the normative nature is about the skills dimension is about the odd definition of critical thinking, is about, if you like, what critical thinking ought to be. We are talking about irreducible epistemic qualities. So some of this we are saying, you cannot talk about critical thinking in the absence of the ability to make critical interpretations. Of course, this is the same question that uh, some of our colleagues asked, who analyzes, who assesses this interpretation? We'll be looking at that. We cannot talk about critical thinking in the absence of the ability to analyze, to break an issue into smaller particles and look at them. We cannot talk about critical thinking in the absence of the ability to evaluate arguments, to make inferences, to make explanations, and indeed, under this kind of irreducible epistemic qualities, critical thinking manifests itself as being self-regulating. It's able to correct as it were itself. We now move to look at uh, to look at the the second the second nature of critical thinking, which we are now talking of as the transformative nature of critical thinking. Now, following from the first element, that's normativity, 
Critical thinking is understood to transform and develop individuals by effecting a twofold provision. In the first place, it develops the individual, both the abilities, that is the individual skills, and secondly, it also develops the necessary disposition for assessing reason. So you see, in the transformative nature, we are now saying, what does critical thinking do? What is the functionality of critical thinking to a person? In this argument, which looks more, more academic, the aim is to appreciate not so much what critical thinking will do outside there, but how critical thinking inheres an individual and transforms that individual. This discussion is to help us appreciate why we must make, for example, critical thinking a central idea in the learning process. Why we must make critical thinking a central idea in organizational, whatever, planning. Because we want to see you as the CEO, you as the headmaster, you as the critical, I mean, the classroom teacher. Can you be able to appreciate the importance of critical thinking so that finally you will appreciate that my learners must become critical thinkers. And that's why we are saying that in this second constitutive principle, as it were, we are saying critical thinking transforms and it develops the individual learner, the individual employee in your organization by effecting two provisions in that learner, in that employee. One, it develops in that learner both the abilities, that is the skills, that's number one, and the necessary dispositions for assessing really what we are calling reason. That is why we said critical thinking by nature is self-regulating because it provides the abilities and it provides the dispositions that will enable this person to be able to assess even his own positions. There is essentially no overlap, actually, between these two aspects. That's the normative aspects or aspect of critical thinking and is development of transformational skills in the individual. Because notice that the first properly refers to the intrinsic nature to the extent that it is defined by its consistency and logical reasoning. The first, the normativity, is talking about the internal configuration of critical thinking. What is critical thinking by nature? You see, the elements that define it, if you like, what it ought to be, as it were. While the second one, which now we are calling, we are referring to as developing the necessary dispositions for assessing reason, this second one is about the functionality of critical thinking. We are talking about what it does as a result of its normativity. That's why we say, just as we look at the closeness between creative thinking and critical thinking, we are also looking at the nature of critical thinking at two levels, the internal nature of critical thinking and the external nature of critical thinking. For Ademi 2012, he would argue that besides the requisite cognitive abilities, which actually define normativity, critical thinking develops what he calls the necessary dispositions that become an intellectual criterion of assessing reason. That, that's how uh, Ademi will look at it. Sigel, on the other hand, would refer to this functionality of critical thinking are simply a cluster of dispositions or habits of the mind. Yet Fashon 2013, together with the Paulo Freire, uh, way back in 1974, this Brazilian thinker, would simply look at this second element of critical thinking, this second quality that defines the nature of critical thinking as a critical spirit. You know, critical spirit in the sense that it is a disposition. And that's why in the previous slides, we are trying to say 
this is something that must be within an individual. It is developed slowly and it becomes part of the nature of that individual. That's why Fashon in 2013 defines it as a critical spirit, defines it as a critical spirit. So we now move to ask ourselves, what is the nature of this critical spirit and how does it manifest itself? Now, the critical nature, uh, I mean, the critical spirit, as it were, manifests itself in various ways. You can see from the slide before us, it manifests itself as a probing inquisitiveness. You know, we, we are talking about this, dear students, especially for those who are teachers. We'll, I'll be giving an example also for those who are not. You see, we meet learners in the classrooms, learners who ask those questions, learners who very easily, when we are asked to write living certificates for them, we easily say, stop being cheeky, or so-and-so is cheeky in class and so forth. We need to ask ourselves, could it be that this learner was demonstrating without even his knowledge, the critical spirit we as the teachers, we were less to understand that that was a demonstration, a manifestation of the critical spirit, which we actually call cheekiness or being stubborn. We need to ask ourselves, could it be true that this learner in the classroom was fundamentally, you know, a disturbing learner? Could that be the case? We need to ask ourselves, those of us who work in various institutions and organizations that may not be educational directly. There is that worker who keep on asking questions in a meeting, he'll not fail to ask a question. Even when you think the issue is settled, you raise up his or her hand to ask a question. Is it true that this worker is just a stubborn worker, is one you not want to put in a group when you are discussing certain things? How does the critical spirit that defines, you know, the critical thinking disposition in an individual manifest itself? This slide guides us to see it manifests itself as a probing inquisitiveness. It manifests itself as a keenness of the mind, you know, questioning even the already settled positions. It manifests itself as a zealous dedication to reason and the hunger or eagerness for reliable information. You know, these are people who will ask questions. We'll be talking about this. We'll ask questions about settled positions in a, in a, in a bid to open the frontiers of knowing. The critical spirit manifests itself, dear friends, as an alertness to opportunities. See, any situation, any limitation that comes before this person, you know, through the critical spirit, the person will see in that limitation an opportunity, an opportunity to do something, an opportunity to overcome his limitations. Paulo Freire, 1974, would say. The critical spirit will be seen in form of a trust and a confidence in the process of reasoned inquiry will manifest itself as open-mindedness on divergent views. The next idea explains the previous one, will manifest itself in form of flexibility in the presence of alternative opinions, flexibility, ability to learn from, from alternative opinions, as the ability to suspend or even change judgment until probable certitude is obtained. So a person in whom the critical spirit, which defines what we are calling critical thinking, is bubbling in, will be a person who holds any position that he has as a tentative epistemic position, a tentative knowledge position, so that his, he or she is able to suspend that position, seek another position, achieve another ground 
when new evidence comes about. Critical thinking manifests this critical spirit through fair-mindedness, intellectual modesty, and humility. If you like, the critical spirit will manifest itself within a sense of credibility, a sense of accuracy, consistency, relevance, and evidence. So these are the kind of things we are asking ourselves. Can we be able to see these things within our school uh, environments? Can we be able to see these things within our workplace, our workspaces, the people who work with us? Can we begin to perhaps appreciate that that madam, that person normally manifests this critical spirit? It just needs to be tapped and perhaps it would be of greater help to the institution. So that is really what we are what we are referring to as the critical spirit, which defines a serious element of what critical thinking is all about. We now focus still more on this critical thinking and uh, quoting, quoting, um, quoting, who is this? Quote, quoting Norris, uh, 1985. Norris gives us three main operational features, but perhaps before we go far, let us listen to Regina. Did I see Regina Waiter? Regina? Regina, is your hand up? Yes, yes, mine is a question. Yes, good evening. Yes, good evening to you. I was just wondering, this yes. critical spirit, is it in the mind of everyone? And if not, how can a teacher develop uh, the critical thinking in a learner? Very well, Waita. In, in our last slide, if you looked at the introductory slide, in our, in our very last slides, we'll be trying to talk about ped pedagogical strategies that we can use to develop critical thinking. Remember, this critical thinking is one of the, um, the, the CBC competencies. So can we hold on that question until we reach that uh, slide, which will help us to see what we call the pedagogical orientation, the pedagogical framework. For teachers, you understand what I mean by pedagogical. For those who are not teachers, we're talking about the methodological approaches we can use even in organizations to be able to develop what we are calling critical thinking. So perhaps, uh, Regina, could you pardon us until we reach there? We'll definitely address it in this discussion, correct? Sure, thank you. Thank you. So we are saying that uh, according to Norris 1985, the critical spirit exhibits three main operational features. Uh, but perhaps before we delve into that, one aspect of uh, Regina's question is that, uh, is it found in every person? You see, what is the critical spirit? The critical spirit is the, the functionality, is, the, is one side of the coin that is called critical thinking. One side of that coin is the normative nature of critical thinking. The other side is how that normative nature functions. It's as if to say that if we pick a 20 shilling coin, of Kenya's currency, if we pick a 20 shilling, a 20 shilling coin of Kenya's currency, and um, we check the head, what is on the side of the head? We check the tail, what is on the side of the tail? You see, if we change one of the sides, it will no longer be a legal currency a legal tender, as it were, for 20 shillings coin, Kenyan currency. Such is how I want to respond to the first part of Waiter's question. Critical spirit is one part, one side of that coin. 
If it is not there, then there is no critical thinking. We cannot define critical thinking. And remember, Waiter, critical thinking is not inborn. It is developed. So that one by itself, it begs your second question. Then how is it developed? And we are going to look into that uh, within this discussion. So three main operational features of critical thinking, how critical thinking operates. We are saying here that on the overall, the critical spirit will exhibit these three main operational features. First, it orders the critical thinking. You know, it orders it. It orders that critical thinking. It orders that critical thinking, how it ought to be applied in practical existential situations without exclusion. So you see, one of the, the, the defining features of this critical spirit is that it demands that critical thinking must be applied in practical existential situations without exclusion. If you like, it orders that critical thinking cannot be an abstract idea only. So if you like, we are trying to say there that this implies that the critical spirit is not a mere cognitive abstraction. It is indeed a practical principle that knows no operational boundary. We are saying this first element, this first operational level that orders that critical thinking must be applied in practical existential situation considers the output considers the verification of our beliefs, considers the judgments of our beliefs and put them together and orders that they must actually touch our practical lives. They cannot simply be things that are founded outside there. Secondly, the critical spirit ensures that critical thinking remains self-reflective. By being self-reflective, it naturally becomes self-correcting. That's why we say critical thinking in being self-reflective, it guides and leads us to truth. Remember, critical thinking is, as it were, a disposition within the individual, a disposition to assess position to assess arguments. So that's why we say it is self-reflecting in the sense that it can be able to correct itself. It can be able to lead us to those frontiers of actually refining our truth positions. Finally, we're saying critical spirit safeguards the essential relationship between action and the thought. And I think we have said something about this before. So you see, critical thinking, we are repeating it, is not actually something we talk about just, you know, you are thinking, your mind, critical thinking. No, it links actually thought and action. It orders that action and the thought must be linked. So I am not a critical thinker if my thinking do not touch the existential parameters of the lives we, li we live in. We now finish this discussion at this level by attempting now to define what critical thinking is. So let's now move towards a definition of what critical thinking is. Now, before we look at this, we need to observe that um, a sound definition of critical thinking must be hinged on its nature. That when we are talking about critical thinking, we must be able to look at those two elements that define its nature. Therefore, quite a number of researchers, you know, see that unity of thought and action in an attempt to define what critical thinking is. For instance, Peter Fashon, has defined critical thinking as a purposeful, reflective judgment which manifests itself in reasoned consideration of evidence. 
context, methods, standards, and conceptualization in deciding what to believe or what to do. This verbatim citation from Peter Fashon, 2013, touches partly on one, what Waruku indicated at the beginning of this lecture about the contextualization of critical thinking. We need to repeat this one again and just see what does it mean. Critical thinking is defined by fashion as a purposeful, a reflective judgment which manifests itself in a reasoned consideration of evidence. So you see, in critical thinking, we have a purposeful, reflective judgment. In critical thinking, we are bringing out our best reasoned, you know, consideration of evidence. In critical thinking, we are reflecting about a practical, if you like, an existential, if you like, context. In critical thinking, we are now looking at the method, the standards, and the conceptualization that will help us to decide two things very critical in understanding critical thinking. Decide what to believe and the what to do. Those two concepts show us the close relationship between thought and action. What to believe, thought. What to do, action. So that is fashion talking to us. Now, Havel Hegel, Sigel, 2010, conceives now critical thinking as a reasonable, reflective thinking that is focused on deciding what to believe and do. You get again those elements coming in. A, reason, a, reason, a reasonable, reflective thinking that is focused on deciding what to believe and what to do. Again, you see the essential link between normativity what to believe, what it is, and what you will do, functionality, the other nature of critical thinking. In the same vein, and based on his commitment to reflective reason, Ademi argues that critical thinking is basically understood to be self-guided, self-disciplined, self-directed, self-monitored and self-correcting think or corrective thinking. So again, you see, there is that idea that in, in Ademi, there is that idea that critical thinking has the power to correct itself. So you see, based on the questions that uh, have been uh, brought forward so far in this discussion, if somebody would choose deliberately not to do something based on his or her best reasoned epistemic positions, then that person is not a critical thinker. Because critical thinking orders us that within existential parameters, we will do the best that the human mind as it were, commands us to do, if you like. We'll do the best that the human mind will command us to do. Now, the implication of these definitions is that critical thinking is therefore not a mere cognitive skill. It's not just something merely cognitive. Instead, it is a practical competency, Fashon would say in 2013. Second, the implication of these definitions is that critical thinking is the ability to think in accordance with the rules of logic. I think this was um, brought forward by one of the questioners in this class this evening. Critical thinking is the ability to think in accordance with the rules of logic, in accordance with the rules of probability, and also 
to apply these skills to real life problems. Karakok 2016 would say. So you see, critical thinking is not just an abstract idea in our mind. Critical thinking is not about somebody who will look at a problem and simply think, what, what would you have done? Or, or rather, these are the options you would have thought this way. No, critical thinking is about linking logic probability with real life's problems. Logic and probability. Probability means you are able to look at alternatives and be able to decide that this could be the best approach in this situation. The final implication of this is that critical thinking unites the cognitive to the affective domain in action. If you like, critical thinking unites reason, that is the cognitive. Critical thinking will un unite reason, that is cognitive, the will, that is the affective domains, and the two will be pushed into action. So you see, those are the implications of this definition. Could we get some people weigh in what they think about this conceptualization, these definitions of critical thinking? Anybody? Maybe we make some progress, perhaps. We make some progress, then we can get some, some people to contribute at a given time. Malim, Malim, I've just made an observation that uh, when then we come to that corner, it would yes. be useful then to be clear from the outset that this thinker must actually be a reasonable person of sound mind. Sound mind, sound mind. What do you mean by sound mind? Uh, the stressful Kenya, for example, has uh, many people moving around who are not necessarily of sound mind. I get, I, I get you. I get you. I think I appreciate that, uh, you know, I wanted to be sure with what you think about that. Because you see, somebody will be able to bring up his or her best, you know, uh, conception of an idea and what he thinks he'll be struggling that he must be able to put this into, into practice. Nyabere. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ri. This is actually a very interesting um, topic area. I'm, I'm reading the... The, the second uh, definition, reasonable reflective thinking that is focused on deciding what to believe and do. Now, when you mention believe here, and you know how uh, sometimes we get cultured uh, yes. into believing, is, is there a separation between belief and thought? And, and, and secondly, uh, and I hope that I'm not, uh, you know, throwing a spanner into the works here. Yes. When yes. one is a critical thinker, how how do they separate their subconscious, you know, what we call the heart, the feelings, from mm -hmm. thought, so that you can now think critically and and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th this was Nyabere talking, correct? I think. Uh... It was in a better talking. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. We, we are reflecting, you are reflecting on that second definition by CGEN 2010. Yes, that you're right. Crit critical thinking is a, a reasonable, reflective thinking that is focused on deciding what to believe and uh, what to do, if you like. And, uh, you know, the, the question you are raising in philosophy is a question founded on what, uh, just to explain what we refer to as uh, Aristotelian Thomistic philosophy. You know, the relationship between, and you know, that one comes, you see the last, the last, um, the last implication unites the cognitive to the affective domains in action. You get that, Nyabere? Yeah, yeah, I can see the, 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 the two uh, domains. Yes, the cognitive and the affective. Now, you see, morality and human action in Aristotelian Thomistic philosophy is about the unity of purpose between the intellect, that's the cognitive, the intellect, and the will. 
when we talk about the cognitive, we are talking about the intellect. And normally, you know, uh, Aristotelian Thomism would say that, you know, the intellect is the light of reason. It will be defined as the light of reason. His objective is the truth. And the will, which is the affective domain, actually has his objective as goodness, the good. And then Aristotelian Thomism would say, the intellect is the only one that knows, is a knowing power, deliberative power. The will, on the other hand, Aristotelian Thomism will say, is a blind faculty that only gets attracted to the good, but it does not know the good. So Aristotelian Thomism would say, in moral action, the will must always submit to the intellect, that what the will chooses to be good must be found to be true by the intellect. What does this mean, therefore, in the light of Siegel's definition of critical thinking? Critical thinking is a reasonable, reflective thinking that is focused on deciding what to believe, meaning the intellect must think and they must decide what is the truth, what is right. This right thing, this truth must be found to be good. In fact, you know, in some discussion on morality, people have said the, the reason why we most of the most of the time, you know, talk about corruption is that the will gets attracted to the good, but that good is not an authentic good, is not the true good. The will gets attracted to there is money in this account or this money which has come to my office, my vote, our vote head, and um the the what um the the holder. The, the holder with the power to spend these funds. I say, if I take about 100,000 to my account and be able to do A, B, C, D, the will says it will be good for you because you will buy a cow, you will buy a car, you will do that, you will buy a plot and so forth. But arguments are in Thomistic philosophy, arguments are reason should be able to say, but that is not your money. So this is the idea. Critical thinking unites the cognitive which helps us to decide the truth to be believed and the affective domain which makes makes that truth to be believed to be attractive often than not the truth is found to be less attractive that's why we are talking about critical thinking must be able to unite the cognitive, the intellect, with the will in the context of action. It must force the will to submit to the intellect. So, sorry, that is a little bit of a digression, but I hope it serves to respond to what uh, Nyabere is raising, that when we talk about focusing on deciding what to believe, then we are talking about what the intellect will do. But remember, what the intellect will do, somebody will say, but different intellects can think differently. But remember, critical thinking has already defined the dispositions that will be based on. Nyabere? I, I understand, sir. And, and I think uh, when I grow up, I want to be like you. Okay, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'm humbled. So we we make a slightly some move whereby now we try to see why critical thinking is now important in education. We now try to ask ourselves why critical thinking is such important in education. So our next slide treats exactly that. Why critical thinking in education? So the idea here is to discuss the rationale, the importance of critical thinking. But before we do that, Obadia, could you talk to us? Yes, please. Uh, um, I have a quick one. I was just meditating about um, critical thinking. And um, uh, I just uh, 
a question popped up in my mind and I was wondering, can we say that um, maybe a critical thinking process has happened after we have the end product and um, the end product is uh, impactful? Or we can still consider it um, uh, like a critical thinking even when uh, um, the end product of it was devastating. For example, uh, like let's say um, the implementation, not the implementation, but if I can go back to um, like um, a few years ago when we had COVID and um, we were told that um, uh, COVID-19 was a result of uh, a lab work that was done um, in um, one of these, uh, these so-called big countries in the world. And um, they now uh, had to put it out, I would say, there maybe to eliminate people. After all, and what you know about COVID and after the knowledge that we got that it started in the lab, can we still consider it as critical thinking? Like uh, these are critical thinkers. Uh, the, the who did the, so, the same job or um, uh, critical thinking should uh, only result to a positive, a positive discovery or a positive conclusion. What is your take, Malima? Yeah, my take, Obadia, on what you have raised, first of all, it touches on the nature of critical thinking. And the first words you used in your address are such that uh, critical thinking is not a product. It's a process of assessing judgments. It's a process of you know, assessing positions so that we can reach reasoned, informed decision-making positions. That's what critical thinking is. So, if we look at it that way, then critical thinking must remain along the way. And you see, you, you raise questions. Do we talk about critical thinking only when we have resulted into a positive? No. Critical thinking is self-correcting, is self-adjudicating. We, we are saying critical thinking is such that Today, we are able to hold this position about this education system in Kenya, competence-based learning. We believe in what we are holding today because the arguments that come our way today convince us that this is the right position. But after two or three years, new thinking comes up. You see, again, born out of critical thinking. Critical thinking is a continuous search, a continuous uh, deliberation on the positions we have. Critical thinking has no sacred reasoned positions. Critical thinking cannot be, cannot be given to, to understand that this position that we have arrived at cannot change. No, critical thinking is the understanding that the positions we hold today, call them, the epistemic positions we hold today are a tentative until new evidence comes by. I think you, you get what we're trying to say there. So that the moment a new idea, new arguments come, then we are able to move towards another position. So using the example you've given of COVID, Look at even other examples of HIV AIDS. There are those theories about HIV AIDS, whether it is a, a biological weapon or not, whether it is started from monkeys, jumped from monkeys or not, whether what have you or not. There are those theories. Critical thinking is this position that will say, what evidence, what re reasoned evidence do we have today? Tomorrow, can we have different reasoned positions? And can those reasoned positions of tomorrow shift our position about what we held today? Othello. Othello. Thank you, Malibu. Good evening. Thank you. 
Good evening. Yeah, this is a very, is a very interesting topic you are discussing today. I'm sorry. I was struggling after coming from Mahadi. We were struggling to set up because the place that I know where people are in those places. So critical thinking, uh, I think this is a good topic. Uh, it is thinking above the normal thinking. As you're talking about reasoned positions and making decisions based on reasoned positions. In Aristotle says that in any commission ethics that uh, the youth or the young are not students of political science because of their tendency to act based on impulse, and not of reason. So when he, he explained that, when he talked about the young or the youth are not students of political science, he's talking about people who are actually thinking below that thinking that can subject a situation to experimental, that you question things. So even when I'm teaching, I tell students, if you come to my class, you have to up your level of thinking and you have to think higher, not, not at the level of ordinary thinking. Because we have a situation here in Africa, many of our leaders, people who are in public positions, many of them are not at the level we are talking about critical thinking. And the decisions that they make are, are rash. They are not rational. So critical thinking subjects a lot of things to questioning. It's about questioning all the time. So I see that don't accept anything from face value. Go deeper. Check under what is there, what is lying under there. So, so uh, uh, Aristotle says that he's talking about people. People may be older in age, but they are not at that level. Those are the people he's talking about, not necessarily young people. They could be young people also who are not at that level because they act on impulse, not on reason. So it is about reason position, questioning situations all the time. Not, don't accept anything from face value. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Othello. And uh, I, I like your intervention. And um, we can quote so many authors, like um, there is a Canadian philosopher, Bernard Lonergan, who would be able to inter interject in our discussion and would tell us that we are talking about achieving what he calls heightened level of consciousness, a heightened level of consciousness. Paulo Freire, a, a Brazilian uh, thinker, educational thinker, would call it, we are reaching a level of critical consciousness. And, and I think it's in that context that Othello, in fact, you brought for the term we've been trying to look for, that somebody asked in this class, what would we refer to that concept? which would be the opposite of critical thinking. What would be the opposite of critical thinking? You know, I was about to say it's bad thinking, but Othello, you've helped us. It's not bad thinking. I think the opposite of critical thinking is ordinary thinking. What do you think of the Othello? Yes, bro, that is what I'm talking about. Ordinary thinking, you are, you are just thinking on the surface. You are not able yeah. to go deeper below the surface and Good. gather information. Thank you. Good. So I think that's what we're talking about. So I think your intervention helps us to focus on what we can refer to as the opposite of critical thinking, ordinary way of thinking. And the way I put it that uh, people like Paulo Freire in, uh, in, in his writings would talk about you know, ordinary minds. We are talking about ordinary minds as opposed to critical minds, minds that are informed or modeled in the context of critical consciousness. So these are the, the kind of dispositions we're talking about. Now, let's look at um, why we need critical thinking in education. We want to see if we can uh, give a justification for the inclusion of critical thinking in educational programs. Now, I'll be, I'll be approaching the remaining part of this discussion at those two levels. One, we will try to justify why critical thinking in education 
and also will try to justify why critical thinking in the ordinary workplace that may not necessarily be educational setting. So we, we look at this slide, the rationale, the importance for critical thinking and especially in educational environments. You see, the question that we like to focus on at this point is this. Why should critical thinking be regarded as an important educational ideal, if you like? And how is this related to individual development and self-fulfillment, especially of the learner? Talking about, for example, educational goals in Kenya, the third goal, which is individual development and self-fulfillment. How can critical thinking be related to that? How important is critical thinking as an educational ideal, you like? Now, the responses that we are able to give to such inquiries and other similar inquiries define the foundations of the pedagogical approaches, the methodological approaches that we will use for teaching critical thinking in our educational programs. Now, beginning with the Stephen Norris, 1985, who describes critical thinking as an indispensable educational ideal. Why does he define it so? Because being able to think critically, Norris would say, is a necessary condition for being educated. You hear Norris talking. Being able to think critically for Norris, it is actually an indispensable. In Latin, we call it, it is a conditio sine qua non for claiming to be educated. For Norris, this ideal is embedded in the learner's individual right to question, to challenge, and demand reasons and justification for what is being taught. You see, learners have a right to question. Learners have individual intrinsic right to challenge. In fact, if you like it, what Norris is saying, as it were, is what we want to say that critical thinking abhors indoctrination. Critical thinking empowers the individual. Now, viewed as subjects and not objects who exist as independent centers of consciousness, Sijen would say that learners ought to be treated, you know, treated with that respect, ought to be treated with utmost respect, capable of determining their destiny. So much so that we can now be able to say Investing in the growth of our learner's individual ability to think critically and indeed promoting his actuality is one of those direct ways of respecting our learners. So you notice, obviously, such positions will abhor an approach that looks at education in the context of rote memorization, in the context of indoctrination. So you notice this argument leads us now to affirm the liberative role of critical thinking. We affirm that critical thinking indeed liberates the learners, liberates individuals, liberates the workers within your organization from what I'm terming here as the caves of mental and social slavery, which are created by uncritical societal and educational practices. Such may include what I'm raising here, things like pedagogies that border on rote memorization. When we go to class, we ask learners to say it after us. We ask them questions and we want those questions, they must bring forth what we told them. Some of our learners will grow to know that teacher so and so, when he asks questions, you better only answer what he gave us in class. If you add on something, you will fail. Rot memorization. Critical thinking liberates 
our classrooms, liberates our workplace from indoctrination. And you'd be thinking, as an institution, as an organization, what do you stand to benefit when your workers are critical thinkers? We'll be saying later, they'll become problem solvers. If they are not, they'll wait upon you. You must be able to bring the solution to their problems. And I think that's why, just to repeat Sigel 2010, that's why he's repeating and emphasizing that critical thinking is part and the parcel of the education's role of creating in learners a sense of individualized self through the process of developing and nourishing the critical spirit, which we, we actually talked about some moments ago. So in the, same, in the same line, we are trying to justify why critical thinking, and we observe that for Fashon 2013, he understands that critical thinking liberates individuals, you see? So in critical thinking, individuals, be they learners, be they, you know, people within your organization, workers, you see, as it were, Peter Fashon emphasizes that critical thinking is that force that we can use to liberate actually our learners, to liberate our workers, to liberate those who work besides us. So this liberation of individuals will definitely lead to the ability to see truth and meaning with reasonable independence and convictions. No, convictions free from what we call naive acceptance of authority. Therefore, critical thinking can lead to principled reflective judgments, see that, which culminates really in that development of the critical spirit. Othello, you'd like to weigh in at this point. Yes, my name is Yes. That, it, uh, it's interesting. Uh, when you're talking about passive population, when you're dealing with passive population, the politicians actually are against educating the public, especially yes. the electorate. They because yes. it's making these people to be aware of their right and actually look deeper into themselves when they are going to cast a ballot at the at the polls. The politicians yes. will rather those people remain the way they are passive and then accept whatever they are told rather than being critical, being, being educated. So they normally clash with civil society organizations who try to bring voter education. That's the thing when it comes to elections. Those are the things. And Paul Ferrari, Ferrari, you are putting there. Paul Ferrari is a book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. He's talking about banking education, the Western education system that was brought to us in the third one is the banking education system. Deposit here and withdraw. It's not like it, that, that we are referring to as road memorization. So deposit and withdraw. Somebody will come and tell you, you, you can't ask question, why is this like this in chemistry or physics? Why is this so? Why is this so? So that you question that, how did this come about? You don't. You just memorize the formula and try to do some calculation and get back to the lecture. It's good for you in the Western world. Why those people are, they are, they are promoting critical thinking in their society, they would prefer us to be passive in our society in, in, the, in the South which is the third word. That's why Pearl Ferrari is very, very, uh, uh, is, is, is very critical of the Western style of education, it's called in, uh, uh, banking education in the pedagogy of the oppressed. Thank you. Correct, Othello. So, you know, further to that, we'll be observing that you see if the way you correctly refer to Paulo Freire's a book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and also if you look at the other book, Education for Critical Consciousness by Paulo Frey again, you, you are able to see, and that will punctuate our end game discussion of what ought to be our methodological, pedagogical approaches to growing critical thinking. You know, we must allow individuals to affirm themselves, we'll be saying. So if we appreciate that the learner, the individuals who work with us, the learner whom we learn together with in the classroom, if we appreciate that they must be liberated, then critical thinking is one of those tools that can help us really to liberate our learners as it were. Now, 
we continue still to talk about uh, that justification. And uh, one of the justification, a further justification for critical thinking is its ability to develop and nourish a democratic culture. So we're saying together with the, with the CGL 2010, uh, CGL 2010, who looking at, um, at uh, critical thinking, he looks at it as really that ingredient, a very important ingredient that will help us in the construction of a rich democratic culture. If you like, CGL 2010 says democracy cannot thrive in the absence of individuals who are firmly rooted in the practices of careful, I mean, who are, who are rooted in those practices of careful analysis, good thinking, and reasoned liberation. If people do not have those disposition, democracy cannot thrive in them. And I think that is what Othello, you are just trying to say. Once we have a population which is, um, we, is not disposed to have this critical thinking, hardly can it be the case, Sigel will say, that democracy can grow uh, amongst them. Uh, for Fashon 2013, he asked that critical thinking constitutes that liberating force in education. It is a powerful resource in one's personal and civic life. So looking at this vis-a-vis -vis even what uh, Karakok uh, 2016 indicated, you can be able to see when learners are being developed into critical thinkers, it is implied that they are individually being encouraged to think for themselves. When learners are being developed into critical thinkers, they are being encouraged to question hypotheses. When learners are being developed to become critical thinkers, they are being fostered to be able to test themselves against the facts. Indeed, questioning becomes the cornerstone of critical thinking, as it were. So you can be able to see, we can be able to appreciate the fact that critical thinking, as it were, to this extent, in learners, in her answers that independent thinking, that personal autonomy and reasoned judgment in thought and action. You see, we still repeat again in thought and action. And that must be the direction that critical thinking must, must actually, must actually stay, go. So critical thinking viewed in this manner and justified in this manner is not fundamentally about giving reasons, but it is fundamentally about clarifying the reasons we have. You see, critical thinking is about investigating our positions. It is about owning those reasons individually. It is about being able to say, why do I stand for this position? That is why at this point I would say, I doubt that critical thinking, just like consciousness, it can be talked about in the context of being collective. Critical thinking cannot be collective. Because you see, critical thinking is about owning these reasons for this position individually. Critical thinking provides the qualification that it is this specific individual who knows. It is this specific individual who is alive and conscious to the fact that he or she knows. So these are the, the things we are referring to as inescapable epistemic grounds for the 21st century. Uh, dear students, you've heard of the discussion on 21st century competencies. Indeed, critical thinking, I said in the, in the very first slides, is one of them. And if you like, it is a very inescapable epistemic you know, grounding that our learners must walk in. Therefore, thinking critically in the 21st century, actually, has come to refer to the individual's ability to design, to manage, and be able to project problem solving, to be able to work about this to better 
the life of others and his own life. So once more again, you can be able to see, besides the development of the democratic culture, we need critical thinking for our learners. We need our learners to be able to learn to think for themselves. Nyerere was very good at this. Developing learners who can be able to question the position they find. That is the only way we can talk about society developing. Now, having tried to, to justify you know, critical thinking in the context of education, it is also important that we don't only end there, but we also struggle to justify what critical thinking is in the workplace. And um, just uh, talking about this author, Yaz Yazidi 2023, he has come up with a beautiful, beautiful writing that really addresses really some of these things in the workplace. But before that, perhaps uh, Nalondo, you would talk to us. I see your hand up, Nalondo. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dr. Rick. I think uh, I raised my hand when I saw my brother, Jimmy Sanya's question on how we can apply critical thinking in conflict resolution at workplace. Yes, and uh, I wanted to give a trial by saying that, um, as we've seen, critical thinking involves analyzing things. You know, a critical thinker will always analyze things objectively, uh, be able to consider all the situations on the table before coming up with the with the solution. And therefore, how this then uh, comes into play at workplaces that. A critical thinker will analyze situations in the workplace. Uh, if you are a principal like he is, you will analyze the problems that have been brought to your table. You need to look at different perspectives of the problem, thoughtfully look for the solutions. And of course, a critical thinker will question. You need to question all both sides before you come up with the, the solution which will uh, help the conflicting parties to go out of your office when they're all satisfied. So it, it is all about analyzing the case before you, uh, questioning the incidences, and then making a judgment. Just the same as a judge in the court of law will apply critical thinking in making judgment of the case. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. That's that voice sounds Wekesa. I, I saw the name Nalondo. Whatever. Yes, Wekesa. Nalondo, Nalondo, it's still me. It's Wekesa. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because Thank I'm you. beginning to master some of the voices when they, they talk. Yeah, so I think Wekesa, you are your argument quite in order. And I think it is coming in timely when we want to talk about the place of critical thinking in the workplace so that uh, we don't remain at that level of just talking about critical thinking in the classroom. You see, these learners go to our schools, they are taught so that they can now go to that uh, marketplace, to that common place in our society, so that they can go to banks, they can go to whatever situations they find themselves. So that's why, finally, the critical thinking we talk about in our classrooms, in our schools, must finally be justified on the basis that do we need the critical thinking in the workplace? Is it necessary anyway? No, that's the question we need to ask ourselves. So thinking about the place of critical thinking in the, in the Juliet, would you like to say something first before I move on? Yes, yes, thank yes, you. Please. Yes. Just a clarification. So in other words, like you are talking about critical thinking, uh, its importance in a uh, educational aspect. So does it mean that uh, it is based on the knowledge that a learner has acquired now it being applied? For example, when you come across a situation, what you learn, because I remember in the initial introduction, there was something like it is a process as uh, you go that through that learning process. So is it based on that knowledge that you have acquired to help you in making decisions or there is something else? 
Juliet, there is something else indeed. You are right. There is something else. Because mm -hmm. those people will have acquired those uh, that knowledge in the classroom together. But they'll be able to approach these things differently in life. You see, um, that element we said, not inborn. There must be a deliberate effort. I'm trying to hold myself not to say much, Juliet, at this point, because I think uh, in a slide that is coming, maybe after this one, I think in the in the final 13th slide, we'll be talking about you know certain approaches that the teacher must use in that classroom to be seen to be growing critical thinking. We'll be, we'll be arguing that, you see, there is no way, there is no way that uh, you simply say uh, people become critical thinkers or learners become critical thinkers in that classroom by chance. No, we, 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 we clarified the two things at the beginning of our discussion. One, critical thinking is not inborn. And the two, we clarified, critical thinking is not developed by chance. Somebody does not become a critical thinker by chance. No. We indicated it must involve a deliberate educational effort. It must involve a deliberate educational effort. So this deliberate educational effort will not be based simply on, on, on content achieved because you see, People are going to classrooms, they are learning mathematics, they are learning chemistry, physics, English, literature, whatever, history, and so forth. But in the real life, they'll be called upon to become critical thinkers, to do two things. One, to make decisions on what they believe, and two, to make decisions on what they ought to do and what they ought not to do. And you see, these things will not be confined in simply the content, the cognitive content achieved. And that's why we'll be talking in the next slide about the extra effort that must happen in a school setting, must happen in a class setting that will work towards growing critical thinking. We'll be indicating how some of those efforts also can be used outside educational settings. So perhaps, uh, Juliet, can we hold on that and then move? All right. So I can see, perhaps before we move, I can see, I saw two more hands. I don't know, they went down. Nalondo, is your hand still up? I think I wanted to answer my sister, but you've already answered it, that uh, it, not just education can make you be a critical thinker. There involves other things. Good. Manyara, Manyara, say something to us. We hear you. Did I see the hand of Charles Manyara up? Perhaps not. Perhaps Manjara did not have his hand up or is not aware of it. So we we, we try to move uh, on. Good, good evening, Dr. Tari. Good evening, Manjara. How are you? Yeah, fine. Thank you. I, I, I was looking at, uh, as we are continuing, and I wanted to ask, how, as people in the education sector, and more so as teachers, we normally have got uh, different categories of students. Yes. We have the high achievers who, who can be able to solve complex problems. We have the average students and we have the weak students. How do we apply the critical thinking aspect across the spectrum? Because uh, as I'm uh, looking at it and as I was listening to you, I, I was trying to look at it from the perspective. What about the weak student? How do they apply this aspect of critical thinking so that they can improve themselves and solve problems in future when they want to gain what I, uh, we call life skills, problem-solving skills through critical thinking? Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, Manyara. Your question uh, makes me to reflect on the 
on uh, Benjamin Bloom's taxonomy of, um, of achievement, whether you want to look at this in the context of cognitive achievement, uh, affective or uh, psychomotor achievement, the, the various levels of uh, learning achievement. And perhaps uh, the best if you are to cite to, to cite the, the, the cognitive taxonomy, the, the six levels of the, 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 the taxonomy. And then it is highly probable that uh, Manyara, you, we are trying to tell ourselves critical thinking is found in the high ordered skills levels of cognitive learning, cognitive uh, achievement. It is not founded in the low levels of remembering, you know, simply comprehending, understanding. No, it is founded in those higher levels of evaluating, analyzing, and creating, and so forth, the higher levels in Bloom's taxonomy. Now, so that one, Manyara, up to that point, we are agreed with you. Now, where would have a lot of trouble with you is that um, how do we define those terminologies you have used, weak students, whatever, uh, you call them low achievers and so forth. You know, the current thinking in learning, in fact, it is soon going beyond what we popularly even called slow learners and so forth. But you see, even at that level of fast learners and slow learners, the argument has been to be able to say that, uh, you see, how do we journey with that low achiever, as you put it? How do we journey with that slow learner so that he comes to comprehend? And I don't want to go into that because it's a detailed discussion about pedagogical approaches to how we can journey with that learner. But far importantly, and as Wekesa put it a few moments uh, before, let's not confuse academic achievement, ac academic prowess with the critical thinking. It does not follow the one who has uh, academic prowess, academic prowess in, in the context of he scores 100, he scores 90, whatever will be high in critical thinking than the one who scores, say, 30%, 20% or so. Because, you see, critical thinking, we are now touching the holistic output of what education has done to this individual learner. But, you see, our school system has tended to say that the one who scored the most is likely to be the best in society. And I think experience has disapproved on that. But let's see, as we are going to, the, to discuss that in a moment, we'll be talking about it just in a moment. So let's look at um, what critical thinking uh, is. Nakari. Yes, Nakari. please. Yes. Uh, 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 would I be wrong to say that uh, the song calls of this world yes. are better critical thinkers than some of our uh, even PhD holders, because you find that uh, they can be able to, uh, to manipulate a populace, a very big voting constituents, to support their views against some of uh, the best, uh, let me put it perhaps in industry, I'm trying to look at Sonko vis-a-vis Polycapi Garden. Yes. Sonko seems to have connected more with the populace at his level against somebody like Igada. And this one can be amplified to almost the whole country if we look at it critically. Does it mean that uh, Sonko was a better critical thinker than Igada? Uh, before, before I invite, I saw some hand, before I invite uh, somebody to respond to this, Yes, you know, you know, as as you talk about this, uh, uh, Manyara, I've been laughing, smiling yes. to myself, and uh, the the reason for this is that if I had time, of course, this is our last class, but if I had time, there are there is some some lecture which I have on my 
computer about the good life. You know, just a philosophical uh -huh. investigation, interrogation of what is good life. You know, if I had time, that's the question I was about to ask you. How does Manyara yeah. define the good life? You know, that's that's the basic question, Manyara. What is the good life? You yeah. know, this, this thing, this question we are raising, we also raised it last week in our last week, week's class. Eh? And uh, when we talked yeah. about elements of leadership, you know, we came closer to saying that the one who is able to whip men to follow him, whether his idea is wrong or not, is likely to be the, the best leader. You, you remember there was that tug of war in argument last week. Is it okay? Yeah, that's, now, yeah, that's this right. Week, this week, we bring in an argument closer to that. And uh, that's why I'm saying that if we had a chance, we could have interrogated the good life. What do we define as the good life? Would have looked at it very philosophically. So that could it be that uh, the end justifies the means? That if I'm able to push people to push to pull strings towards myself to be able to become rich to be able to multiply the wealth i have to be able to have very many people sing me praise me and then i'm the best leader and i'm leading the good life that's a question i cannot pretend to journey through in the context of this lecture but i think by saying that i think manyara you hear me you hear me is it okay yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting it. Yes. Yeah. We need we really need to go deeper and define what would constitute the good life. Because you see, critical thinking, you know, cannot be, you know, it it must be able to serve humanity. And uh, you know, if I was to conclude that discussion, I would have said that um, if all of us are not safe then none of us is. If all of us are not satisfied, and then you see Bill Gates will still not be satisfied despite the billions, whatever. So that element of humanity, I think, must, must punctuate what we are able to do. That element of humanity, it must be able to punctuate what we are able to do. Madian. Madiang? Um, um, thank you. Let Madiang uh, come, then Othello will come. Madiang? Well, Othello, Bwana, you take it at me, part of participation points, Bwana. Go ahead, brother. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, thank you very much for that. And um, I think in this class, there are some people whom I am very happy we are in class with. Yes. One of whom is Mara, and I hope uh, we will keep the contacts. I just wanted to respond to Manyara's yes. question. And I wanted to say, based on what I have heard in this uh, class, that critical thinking abhors populism. So that what you are referring to as the song calls and what Eric Omondi is doing currently are more about uh -huh. populism and yet critical thinking, as we have been uh, taught, probably goes beyond the element of it's not common, it's not popular even, because it deals with matters beyond folks' need for an easy way out. So I would have answered your question by saying, and creating the phrase, that critical thinking abhors populism. In fact, populism may be a benefit from simple thinking. Uh, my take, I may be wrong, and back to you, uh, Dr. Ari. Very well. Uh, I think, Othello, you <laughs> are... Ari. Yes, who is that? <laughs> Dr. Ari, before you, inter you interject, I want yes. to, to ask, based on what Othello has said, if you look at the current situation in our country. Yes. The leadership that we have, the challenges that are there. Can, can we look at it that uh, the leadership that we had, from what Othello is saying, did we pick populism 
against critical thinking because I think it is the other way around. And then we went wrong. That's my take. Yeah, you know, the people who picked are here. They, they can be able to say whether they picked it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, <laughs> I think I just, yeah. Yeah. I just, I just, you know, the they are, so are much, here. And they can be able. Yes, but I there's so much to say. This class, we don't have time to say about this thing. But I just yes. want to say something small that critical thinking requires mental anguish. If people are not prepared to go through mental anguish, they will accept, you know, very low level of thinking. They will say, oh, this is very good, like it's mentioning about something there. So those people will go with populism because they do not want to strengthen their mind. Critical thinking requires you to strain your mind. <laughs> you have to go deeper into your mind and strain your mind. So people are not prepared to, 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 to go through mental anguish. So they don't want to go that, that path, the critical thinking path. Thank you. Very well. Uh, is uh, is Wekesa's hand still up? Yes. Uh, Doctor, I wanted to respond to the question on weak students. Yes. Uh, and how they can be able to use critical thinking to improve on their performance. <clears throat> and this is what I had to what this is what I want to say. We appreciate the introduction of CBC, for example, where we the, the teachers are able to put the pupils on task on coming up with solutions so that they're able to think for themselves, so that they're able to to be able to critic what they have been given for in order to come up with their with their answers. And so I was I was I was trying to look at what critical thinking does to an individual and what constitutes critical thinking, for example, analyzing and uh, being able to question perspectives so that you're able to then come up with the solution. And therefore, in answer my brother on how we can be able to use critical thinking so they can be able to improve on the performance is, for example, a putting them to task so that they're able to think outside the box, enabling them to, to engage in group discussions. Sometimes I look at what we are given by, for example, if I would use what uh, Professor Hiro does to this class, sometimes he poses a question and it takes a whole minute people thinking about it. And therefore, those kind of uh, question engagement also helps the weak students to, to improve on their critical thinking. Of course, uh, identifying their mistakes and evaluating the information that have been given to them. And therefore, by doing so, it helps the weak students to, to improve on performance. Thank you. And uh, of course, I know for the CPC teachers, they will agree with me. Okay, Nyabere, make the final whatever intervention on this, then we move. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I wanted to, to weigh in on uh, what Madiang talked about. Uh, he asserted uh, very firmly that uh, populism abhors a critical thinking. No, no, no. Critical thinking abhors populism. And I'm wondering, politics is actually a science, and, and, and it's a game at the same time. Can we say that when one is popular and is able to uh, to attract, you know, votes, for example, can we say that such a person doesn't think, doesn't it require thought to be able to, you know, strategize, scheme, and and get people to support you? Because if if we say that when somebody is popular, like you know, the likes of Sonko and others. Uh, they, they they really don't think i don't think it's right because these people think and we are, we have seen that you uh, you yourself doctor have uh, asserted that uh, it doesn't follow that when you are educated you are a critical thinker no thinking like you're saying it's a process it's something anyone can learn so even an unschooled person can learn to think critically and i believe that uh, you cannot critically separate populism from critical thinking. And, and, and I think it will be unfair for us to pass judgment 
that when one is very popular, it follows that they are not critical thinkers. And that when one is a critical thinker, then it also follows that they cannot be popular. My two yeah, cents. I, I, I hear you, Nyabere. And before we comment, Gaki, Gaki, I see. Gaki. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Uh, just to actually uh, add up to add to what uh, Sam has taken us to, uh, mainly when uh, Chris was looking at uh, the weak learners and the strong strong learners, I was actually asking myself, how do we actually divide these particular students into or categorize them in that area? Is it because they are not as academically gifted, and that's the scope we are looking, we are looking at them or putting them with? Whereas these students, they might be actually weak within the class setup, that's their academic scope. But when it comes to the co-curricular, they actually shine out there and they are able to exhibit their critical thinking through how they handle that ball, through how they are engaged in teamwork. So just not limiting the, uh, the scope on critical thinking on the academic grounds, but looking at it wholesomely. Thank you. Very well, Gaki, sure. You know, the all-round perspective of the learner and being able to see how they also employ critical thinking in other fields, not just in a, a academic cognitive uh, dimension. Brenda. Yeah. Um, Brenda, your hand is up. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can Hello. hear you, Brenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Anyway, yes, I, I can just... hear you, Brenda. I noted that um, this this discussion has really been male dominated, but I'm glad at least you've given us a chance to speak. <laughs> yes. The males are really they are flowing seriously. Yeah, but we are here also. We have very. Whenever you mention politics, male dominated. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I tend to think that um, critical thinking is applied contextually in different contexts, uh, depending on uh, on on uh, different circumstances. So when you talk about um, a slow or rather a learner who is not gifted, like um, my my fellow <clears throat> uh, fellow student has mentioned. That a learner who is not academically gifted is gifted uh, in a different, uh, you know, maybe in a co curriculum activity. Uh, and, you know, for you to be able to be good at something, this is, this is a skill that you have mastered. And we've said that critical thinking is a skill. So the moment you've sharpened this particular skill, then it enables you, it brings you to a particular level of a critical thinker to be able to. Uh, See, see to it, see to to it. I mean, to be able to make it a success. So, I also want to say that when you look at creativity and critical thinking, they go hand in hand because we're saying that um, creativity is a is a is a is a game changer. This is where you find solutions. You come up with new ideas. Whereas a critical thinker or critical thinking analyzes the particular new ideas and the particular solutions. So, when you bring the issue of popularity. Uh, you know, it's a skill also to be able to win people's hearts. It means that you've studied them for a period of time, you've mastered their psychological well-being, and you know the kind of language to use to be able to win them. So um, politicians are equally uh, critical thinkers in their own um, aspects or in their own dealings. So it all depends on where do you want to apply, where do you want to uh, apply the definitions of critical thinking in uh you know, in your thoughts or in different um, aspects in life. Thank you. Yeah, I think you are right, Brenda. And I think uh, as as you have been talking, uh, I made some notes, and my notes um, indicate to me that you know we are saying uh, critical thinking does not necessarily mean we can't be wrong. You no, know, because we need to make that clear. It does not mean that a critical thinker cannot be wrong. In any case, that's why we said critical thinking is self-correcting. If it is self-correcting, it is assumed it has a possibility of being wrong. So critical thinking does not necessarily mean that we can't be wrong. 
for me, critical thinking really heightens our level of penetration into issues and arguments. For me, that is what that is the import of critical thinking. It heightens, it, it takes our level of getting into issues higher. It takes that level higher. That's why in my notes I say it heightens our level of penetration into issues and arguments. But you see, as we penetrate those issues and arguments and come up with the positions, remember we have said those positions remain tentative as far as our arguments, our evidence, you know, remain forceful, remain uh, truthful for today. But upon the coming up of new evidence, those positions can change. So I think those two points, and the brand, I think you, you looked at it quite correctly. Critical thinking does not indicate that we are free from error. However, at the point that we are thinking critically, it means we are putting forward our best rational foot on an issue. So that even if we are wrong, one would argue this is the best in that environment. But remember, it is not just the best in that environment because everybody else will come with the best. That's why I add on critical thinking heightens the level at which we get into an issue. So let's make some progress and be able to look at uh, the place of critical thinking really in the workplace. And I had uh, indicated that uh, if you get a chance to, to read that, um, th that source, Yazidi R 2023, Strategies of Promoting Critical Thinking Classroom, in that journal, International Journal of English Literature and so forth, you can be able to get up uh, quite a bit of this. Let's make some progress and then we'll come back to pick up the two hands that are uh, upraised. So what are we saying about critical thinking in the workplace? That's really what we're trying to say. So the importance of critical thinking in the workplace cannot actually be overstated. Indeed, we are saying critical thinking skills are among the most important skills needed for success in the modern workplace, alongside very many other skills. You talk about skills like communication, collaboration, creativity, and so forth. Critical thinking is one in this package, and we cannot overemphasize that critical thinking is a critical skill required in the workplace today. So critical thinking in the workplace refers to that ability of the employees to analyze and evaluate information, identify problems and develop and implement really effective solutions to the, to the issues that we are having. Critical thinking also will involve really the use of logical and analytic skills to make informed decisions. This issue was raised sometimes earlier that when we are Hello. talking about Hello. critical thinking, we are talking about the ability to use logical and analytical skills to be able to make informed decisions, to be able to solve complex problems. We are actually making a case for the place of critical thinking in the workplace, such that critical thinking is important in the workplace because it can help organizations and institutions to improve their operations. It can also help us in institutions and organizations to increase efficiency. Yeah, it can also help us to be able to improve efficiency in, um, in the workplace. So you see, for example, critical, critical uh, thinking is able to achieve all these things by helping organizations actually to improve what they are able to do. Employees, for example, who are skilled in critical thinking are better equipped to identify potential issues and develop innovative solutions within the organization. This is why my argument would be that, actually, if you are a CEO, if you are a head teacher, You'd love to have teachers in your school 
who are critical thinkers. You'd, have, you'd love to have workers working in your organization who are critical thinkers. And you can see the place, the argument we are repeating for them. You see, besides this, we can be able to say critical thinking can also help employees to communicate more effectively with their colleagues and the customers. You are perhaps in an NGO, you are in a, in a banking sector, you are in engineering sector, what have you, in whatever sector you find yourself in. Critical thinking can help those who work together with you to communicate more. Think about, think about nowadays in banks, they have employed people who actually would go outside there to buy, to, to sell products or policies of the bank, to have people open up accounts or buy the, the policies of that bank and so forth. It will be a greater idea if you have the people going out being critical thinkers, the way they are able to communicate to customers more effectively, the way they are able to communicate to their fellow colleagues, to their fellow, to the to the clients outside there. So by using logical and analytic skills to understand and address the needs and concerns of others, you see, employees can be able to build stronger relationships and be able to improve the overall collaboration uh, of, of and the teamwork within an organization. So we emphasize the importance of critical thinking within a given organization. Finally, we want to observe that um, critical thinking can help employees adapt to change more effectively. So in this society that um, we live in, where a lot of changes coming in, employees can be able to adapt to changes Talk about technology we are bringing in. You are perhaps working in Safaricom or something. The technology is coming in. Why are we arguing for critical thinking in the workplace? You see, employees can be able to adopt to change. And furthermore, or finally, employees can, be more, can become more effective problem solvers within the organization. So in this slide, we make a case, an open case, a bigger case for why critical thinking in the workplace, not just in the classroom. And remember, this is tied together. We need critical thinking in the classroom where our children go to, so that as they graduate and they come out as critical thinkers and get to the workplace, we can now be able to reap those whys. We can now be able to reap those advantages of having a society that is actually founded on critical thinking. Finally, before I invite any, any further interventions, we'd like to end this discussion by looking at the strategies that we can use to promote critical thinking, especially in the learning environment. Nalonda, I can see your hand up. Nalonda? Is your hand up? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. So we look, in this final slide, we look at the strategies that we can use to promote critical thinking. Now, I would like us to remember, as I've put in the slide, that the development of critical thinking, especially in learning environments, is majorly about the pedagogical orientations that would be adopted by teachers. You know, the methodological approaches. You see, critical thinking, and I think somebody brought this a little bit earlier, although I may not be able to know exactly who. Somebody brought this one up. Critical thinking is not simply found in the confines of the what that is taught. Critical thinking is not majorly about what was taught to the learner. Critical thinking has something greater to do with how it is taught. It has something to do with the pedagogical, the methodological orientations that teachers adopt. You see, critical thinking is one of the 
the 21st century skills. If you like, critical thinking is one of the skills that is advocated in the CBC when we talk about competence-based curriculum. One of the competencies is critical thinking. Now, critical thinking within that curriculum will not be guaranteed on the basis of the content that is taught. If you asked me, I would say, the realization of critical thinking in our schools, in our learners, perhaps 80% of it will depend on the how teaching happens, the how not the what is taught, but the how of what is taught is done. That's why we peg our flag, our argument on the pedagogical orientations that are adopted by the teacher. So we now look at some of the pedagogical strategies that can grow critical thinking within our classrooms, within our society. So we need to note that uh, even those among us who are not uh, from the teaching orientation background can still benefit from this discussion, uh, this discussion about the strategies in the sense that, you know, we can now be able to appreciate how we can grow critical thinking also in our various organization, organizational structures. So some of these um, uh, pedagogical orientations that can uh, grow critical thinking, I have listed them on the slide. They include uh, the, what we call Socratic questioning, collaborative learning, inquiry-based learning, uh, concept mapping, problem-based learning, and uh, what we can call argument mapping. However, this list does not exhaust what I would call uh, pedagogical orientations that can grow critical thinking. So in a nutshell, I would like to just look at perhaps each of these and be able to explain in passing what each one uh, entails and how each one can be able to grow critical thinking. Were we to begin with the Socratic questioning, the observation here is that, um, first of all, what is Socratic questioning? This generally understood to be a technique that is used to promote critical thinking by using, or rather, if you like, by asking a series of questions that challenge our assumptions, that challenge or clarify our concepts, and even uncover the evidence that we didn't know. We call it Socratic questioning because it is named after a great Greek philosopher, Socrates, who was known for using this method to lead his students to deeper understanding and insight. So the importance of Socratic questioning in developing critical thinking lies actually in his ability to help individual learners, or if you like, individual people within an organization to be able to examine and evaluate their own thinking and the thinking of others. So when we talk about Socratic questioning is that you have a position or your neighbor, your friend has a position which you know, but you try to ask for the sake of learning, not for the sake of challenging it simply, but for the sake of evaluating how firm that grounding is, how firm that position is. So that's why we say, by asking thought-provoking questions. Socratic questioning can actually help individuals to identify the biases they have. You see, they, they can also be helped to clarify the concepts they already believe in. They can be helped to really clarify and consider alternative perspectives to what they know. So you can see Socratic questioning can also help individuals to identify gaps, like um, you people, I'm sure you are taking lessons with the professor you know, on research methods and um, talking about an issue like, um, like investigating a problem area for study. You see, Socratic questioning 
can help you identify those gaps in knowledge, can help you understand an issue better, can help you question that if so and so said this and so and so said this, you know, where is the gap in this? So Socratic questioning, you see, it can sharpen our critical thinking skills. So a teacher who goes to class and engages learners in Socratic questioning, you see, a learner is asked a question. When he gives an answer, that answer is probed further. That is what Socratic questioning is. You know, you know, somebody, a, a teacher who asks the learners in class, what do you mean or what is good life? And then learners respond, good life is A, B, C, D. Perhaps good life is owning such wealth and so forth. Then the teacher goes forward to say, so between, you know, pastor so and so, and uh, so and so who owns this wealth. Do you mean to say uh, the one who owns more wealth is leading a good life than this pastor? Then the learner says, oh, no, 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 no. I think the pastor could be leading a good life. Then go ahead. So what is the good life? That is Socratic questioning. You know, you probe against and through the kind of arguments or responses that are given. You see, so you can see how Socratic questioning, you know, it keeps engaging the learner to the frontiers of knowing. Socratic reasoning or Socratic questioning, it, it keeps knocking the learner at the, the horizons of knowing so that those epistemic horizons can be opened to greater levels of, of knowing. The, the second uh, approach on our list, the collaborative learning, Again, here, collaborative learning to be understood properly as a teaching strategy that involves students working together in smaller groups, or if you like, in pairs, as it were, to solve problems, complete their tasks, and even discuss concepts. You can put learners together in, in groups. They can complete some given task. They can solve the problems you've given in class and so forth. Now, what is fundamental is that this approach can be particularly effective in improving critical thinking skills since it provides those students with the opportunity to engage in active learning. Students are given opportunities to exchange ideas, to challenge each other's perspective, collaborative learning. So collaborative learning, one learner is giving an idea, others are challenging it. You see, something also of the Socratic questioning you can clearly see how collaborative learning can actually, again, open the doors for critical, critical thinking. Now, if you wanted, for example, to employ collaborative learning in the classroom to improve critical thinking as an instructor or as a CEO in that company, you can, for example, assign group projects or assignments that require critical thinking skill. You know, such as analyzing case studies, you can ask them to analyze, you know, a given case study, you can ask them to solve complex problems and so forth. So the first approach you could use in collaborative learning is just assign group projects or assignments that will demand of those learners to engage critical thinking skills. Another second way you could approach under collaborative learning would be simply to encourage you know groups group discussion and the debates where students can share their thoughts and ideas and even can challenge one another's assumptions so in this line then you can see the use of for example debates in schools where you really push learners to participate in this in the workplace you can use similar approaches, just use of debates in, in classrooms, in organization, ask, ask your employees to discuss something. This can push the agenda of collaborative learning and an appreciation for critical thinking. Still on collaborative learning, you can also provide you know, some guidelines and expectations for group work. You know, you can provide them, you know, with 
things, you know, guidelines that I would like you to do this, you know, so that this can facilitate the communication between the group members and ensure that everyone within the group is participating and contributing really to the discussion. So you can see collaborative learning can become a very effective way of really growing critical thinking. Remember, critical thinking, you want to send that student, that employee into his mind to think about this, this the problem at hand and relate it to practice. That's what we're talking about. Now, the third approach, pedagogical approach, is what we call inquiry-based learning, inquiry-based learning. And again, inquiry-based learning is a pedagogy, is a method that involves students actively engaging in the learning process by asking questions, you know, inquiring. So students are learning by inquiring, by asking questions by investigating and even sometimes exploring information which they have. They can also do this by creating their own understanding, inquiry-based. Sometimes we talk of inquiry-based learning, we, we use the terminology heuristic learning. You see, heuristic learning, learning by self-discovery, learning by self-discovery. This can also become a very powerful way of growing critical thinking. So this approach can actually improve critical thinking by simply encouraging students to think deeply, to analyze information and draw conclusions based on the evidence actually they adduce. Now, fourthly, the most interesting one I find is this we call concept mapping. No. So what is concept mapping? Ma mapping rather, concept mapping. You see, a concept map, or uh, what sometimes some authors refer to as a conceptual map or a conceptual diagram, is simply a diagram or a framework that will depict suggested relationship between concepts. You know, concept maps are supposed to be visual representations of information. You see, for those who are teachers in the classroom, you think about charts and, and you see, dear, dear students, you know, I told you I actually come from the, partly from the education background. And sometimes when I go out to assess students on teaching practice and you find these student teachers have put up Manila papers. You know, it is not everything put up on Manila paper that is that can be called a chart no it is not everything you see really to be able to understand it is supposed of course to bring the concept of a chart but you see we are getting this concept this idea concept mapping if it is con if it's a chart that depicts that is under the context of concept mapping then you must be able to show the relationship between, between the concepts you have. That's why we call it concept mapping, to show the relation between concepts. You see, we can talk about examples of concept mapping as well-constructed charts, the, the graphic organize, organizers, the tables, the flow charts, the various diagrams we can even use in mathematics and the like, the timelines, you see, all these things, so far as they are able to show certain relationship of concept, they can pass to be called actually conceptual diagrams or simply concept, concept maps. So how does concept mapping become an effective way of developing critical thinking? You see, we observe that concept mapping is uh, to be understood as a visual tool that will help your students to visualize, to organize and represent knowledge in a meaningful way. So if you are able as a teacher, as an instructor, as a facilitator, to come up with very good you know, concept maps, conceptual diagrams, once learners look at them, that they can be able to visualize knowledge. They can be able to package knowledge more easily. So you see, the process of creating a concept map 
on the part of the teacher will definitely require you know, critical thinking skills such as analyzing, uh, you know, uh, synthesizing, evaluating information and so forth. You see, you must be able to do it so well that the learner will be able to penetrate the intentions you had in trying to do this concept mapping. Finally, we talk about problem-based learning, which this one speaks for itself. You know, this can be used, for example, in project uh, project learning. You know, we can give your learners projects so that they are pushed to be able to solve a given problem, to learn by solving problems. So, problem solve problem-based learning is actually an instructional approach that will involve students working again collaboratively to solve very authentic and real world problems. So problem solving, um, problem-based learning here can be found to improve critical thinking in students, not just because students are working together, but by providing them with opportunities to analyze the, pro the existential problems that they find within their environments. And then very lastly, the argument mapping Argument mapping simply is about, you know, trying to visualize an argument, the structure of an argument, trying to visualize what sometimes we call in logic fallacies. For example, if I say, if I say all animals eat grass as first argument is one, then I say cows are animals or all cows are animals then you should be able to visualize the structure of argument. You argue, you map the argument, and you are able to conclude, therefore, all cows eat grass. You see, you are able to see which one is the major premise, which one is the minor premise, therefore, how does the conclusion come about? So, dear students, these are some approaches, and uh, they are not limited to this. These are some approaches that can help us develop critical thinking within our classrooms. You can be able to use this if you work in an NGO, if you work in the public sector, if you work in whatever organization. When you go out to, to, do, to facilitate discussions, to facilitate some learning, you know, you can actually invest in some of these approaches so that you know, the problems you are trying to solve through critical thinking, the problem that your NGO is trying to solve in the society, you make your participants become the problem solvers of those problems instead of actually being seen to give them the solutions. So this is what we can say about um, critical thinking. This is what we can say about critical thinking. And uh, perhaps before we leave, I'm imagining one or two responses, or rather, Osanya, I can see your hand up. Osanya. Good evening, Victor. Yes, good evening to you. Uh, I've really enjoyed this evening uh, class. And mine is, uh, is it, we are saying teachers should be, uh, teach critical thinking can you can you teach or can you impart what you are not or are we assuming that all teachers are critical thinkers mm -hmm. my tech my quick tech would be all teachers ought to be but it is not true all teachers are because you see the moment you think about classrooms where the learners do not have a voice, that is the first indicator critical thinking will suffer. That's the first indicator that this teacher's critical thinking skills can be called to question. The moment you think about a classroom where, you know, you know those of you who are teachers, you understand where really the teacher goes to that class and the learner is viewed as an object and not a subject, not as a core participant in learning, but rather as an empty vessel to be filled. Again, critical thinking will suffer. So I think, Osanya, you can see indications to the questions you are the question you are raising. Osanya?
Anybody else before we leave? Uh, Othello, a short one. Yes, a short one. I want to, to just say to my friend uh, Sam that uh, during the the twenty uh, that was twenty we had twenty twenty two elections, so that was twenty uh, seventeen elections. Uh, Sonko, the fans of Sonko here, maybe they will, they will roast me in some of the things I would just say. I would say short because I have a lot to say about that. Uh, Sonko refused to come for the debate, the gubernatorial debate. You see, critical thinking, he, he, he was coming to this debate, you have to be, to have critical mind to come for such a debate. So as a result, Miguna Miguna and maybe a couple of guys came here and were at this auditorium. So Sonko refused to come. You know, Sonko gained popularity because he used to just dish out money to people. And people who do not want to engage in critical thinking, they make you a hero because they will not want to go through that path of questioning, where did he get his money from? But so long as they get, they, they get their money given to them, it's okay. So then, Malimu, you talk about the, I don't know, you, I, I heard, I overheard something like, this is the last class, is this the last class? Yes, you are right, Othello. This is our last class, Malimu. Yes. Othello, did you hear me? Yes, it is the last class. I think we are having difficulties getting Othello. Yeah, it could be. I, I had I had a blackout here where I am. There was a blackout, so at some point I disappeared. Okay. So maybe maybe let let me make uh, some concluding remarks because as uh, so as to confirm what Othello is saying that this is our last class. I would like to make some concluding remarks. Now, I want to say that uh, I've, I've enjoyed discussions with you. Remember, you are the maiden class of this program. Sometimes when you are a maiden class of a program, there are, there are mixed, uh, mixed things, mixed understandings. Uh, sometimes people are trying to package materials and so forth. But I must say, I have found your class to be very interactive. Your, your interventions have pushed my understanding of concepts to higher levels, which I appreciate you for. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we should be able to meet for other courses, perhaps in the subsequent semesters. But, uh, but I want really to conclude by really hoping Hoping is my word, hoping that uh, you people have been able to benefit, to benefit from our classes of educational policy and practice, to be able to see the way we began of how, you know, policies are formulated, structures of policy, how they are analyzed and so forth into those, um, those international regimes and so forth. So I want to hope that some of these observations will go a long way in helping you become a renewed person where you work, in your workplace, in your understanding of concepts and so forth. With this, perhaps, um, I think Brenda was our representative. So unless there is somebody, one or two, who want to talk before Brenda, I want to invite Brenda to make her concluding remarks, then we close the class and the course. Let me begin, Dexari. Yes, Weka, sir. Uh, I wish on my own behalf and the behalf of those who may not be able to speak this evening to most sincerely thank you and uh, thank uh, Dr. Yuya, of course, with the prof for coming up with this program. And in particular, thank you for the services that you rendered to us for the consultative teaching discussions and everything that you've had. Personally, I've had to call you so many times when when I did not know which 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 uh, topic we were handling, where were the questions, and you've been so accommodative to me in particular. And so I want to thank you for the time that we've had for this uh, unit. 
And of course, looking forward to many other interactions before the end of the program. And so thank you so much, Dr. and may God bless you. Thank you. Over and out. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Dr. Can, can I take a second and say something? OK, yeah, Nyabere, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just wondering uh, if there is a possibility of you taking us through another unit in the next semester. And if there is none, is there a possibility of uh, someone interested getting uh, to contact you directly? Right. Yeah. You 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 have heard that Wekes has been able to go. To contact me directly always much more willing as a trained teacher always available i'm crossing my fingers i don't know what is in stock with the dr carolina i'll be talking to her i think there could be one or so so courses still to come but still in case there is none that brings us together in class i think i've equally had my dance a very wonderful dance i would say myself no, you do have a course coming up next semester, so, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Dr. Caroline, you are here. I thought you are not here. <laughs> All right. So I think, uh, Nyabere, you've been answered. Yeah, and I'm very grateful All right. for that. Because so, I, yeah, I was saying that you, you are aware well to draw from, and I, I'll be very excited to join the next semester. Thank you very much. All right. Doctor. Thank you. Yes, yes. Who is talking, Manyara? Uh, Silvanus. Silvanus, yes, Silvanus. Yes, uh, I have enjoyed your lectures. And uh, one of my colleagues called Masimwende, you taught her uh, in her undergraduate. She has also enjoyed some of the lectures. And uh, she said that you are one of her favorite lecturers. So, uh, and so are you to me. So I've enjoyed every bit of it, and I hope the knowledge that I've gained throughout will be able to uh, help me do more and research to be like you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Silvanus. I think we now listen to Manyara, and then we bring in the class rep to wrap it up. Manyara, you are the last one before the class representative can talk. Manyara? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Doc. Uh, it has been quite an interesting uh, session and uh, an interesting class. And more so, I've really had uh, quite an insightful learning, more so in uh, international regimes and this critical thinking aspect. With the international regime, as um, I'm normally interested in uh, current affairs and world affairs, really opened my eyes into the thinking of uh, diplomats and what they do, and how countries are able to work, either to monopolize, to manipulate, or to make sure that their agenda is felt. And the critical aspect as a teacher I think it's something that I've really enjoyed because uh, it has opened some uh, thinking into myself and how I can develop and assist my students. I'm really grateful and may God bless you, Dr. Tari. Thank you very much, Manyala. Now, Brenda, would you like to talk? Oh, sorry, yes, sorry, yes, Doc. Um, sorry, sorry, Doc. Just one, one question. Uh, even though this is, the, this is the end yes. of the classes i yes, hope that you are available to the end of the semester for photo one on assignments and any other yes consultants. yes okay like thank you thank you. The, thank you on the platform the whatsapp platform you see i'm still there very active trying to make sure when there is a problem i'm trying to forward it to where solutions would come from and i'm also engaging on one on one on to people who have difficulties in understanding a few things we are still discussing. So I open that platform wide and um, great, uh, my dear. Eh? So I think we now give this chance to the final talk 
from Brenda. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kigode. And uh, I want to start um, my remarks by stating a quote that says, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. So this is a quote by Steve Jobs. And uh, I think you have done what you love doing most, Dr. Tari. And so that has propelled you to give us the best of among the best during this particular session. So I want to thank you so much for taking us through ELP 610, that is Education Policy, Foundations and Practice. Um, I'm so glad that at least we really had a very good session and you brought us to understanding policy formulation and implementation, some of the models that we need to use for policy formulation, some of the theories in policy making, and lastly, critical thinking. So uh, on behalf of my classmates, I want to say thank you so much and may God bless you. May he give you long life so that we meet in next session and uh, so that you continue steering and seeing us uh, towards the end of um, our master's program. Thank you so much, Dr. Terry. Thank you. Perhaps, Dr. Caroline, you have something to say, just in case, then I close the class. Not really, Dr. Terry. I have, uh, I've been recording this class while on the route uh, from the prisons in, I think the last prison was in the Boston Institution in, in Kakamega, and I officially arrived in my house. So I've been following the class, I've been live. It is interesting to have this dynamic class and uh, you have been amazing. Uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm always in this class. So when I'm always in this class, I'm also learning. And uh, it's a good experience to learn with uh, my colleagues here and just to see how this goes. Uh, I also can't wait to have you back teach us another course next semester. Uh, uh, you know, next semester we still we have about I think four. We have leadership and policy. We have uh, we have theory because organizational organizational behavior. We have statistics coming in. We have uh, uh, um, seminars and research continuing. So basically, it's going to be a very interesting class because this is where they're going to choose in uh, some topic, develop their proposal because we want them by prof by end of uh, by beginning of August they are doing the data collection and moving out coursework complete only in the field so they have only two semesters to go for coursework which is really interesting as they move out to go and collect data so I can't wait what they don't what they should know is that you know you can't drop a course you you are taking as a package to enjoy the discounts to enjoy the benefits so we are moving this class as a court as it is until when they finish end of August and we give them our blessings to look forward to January 2025 PhD if they want. So basically, uh, it's like you can't miss a course, you can't drop, you can't choose. You have to go as a package also to enjoy the fee, small fee uh, that they're paying here. So so basically, you've been the best thing to have this session. And uh, I have learned too. They, they also told me they are giving me this degree for free. So if it's okay, you'll give me free marks and free everything so that I can enjoy. <laughs> it has been nice. It has been nice enjoying your time yes. together with these, these folks. This giving me marks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So friends, I want to give each one of you my hearty clap. Thank you for having availed yourself in these classrooms, always coming around, helping us to think about ourselves and helping us actually to deepen, to strengthen our thinking and our convictions about the things that Brenda said we love doing best. So thank you very much. Bye. And we continue talking. Thank you. Bye. So Dr. what you can do, just say stop. When you go to where there's live, and then there's a button called stop, then it will stop because you're the host, you'll stop, or you can make me the host. And I can stop the Zoom, uh, the, the live YouTube recording. Whatever works for you. Okay. Or you can just give me the host. You can make me the host, and then I will stop okay. it. Okay. Okay. So everybody, enjoy your night, enjoy your time. I, I, it looks like it feels fulfilling, amazing, and everything about the course when you'll be doing your surveys. We'd like this feedback. So Dr. That we can always, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Let's go. Dr. Uh,
here. That car, if you can make me the host, just you might, I'm using Desta Odell. Desta Odell is my yeah, yeah. is my account. Uh, yeah, Someone was asking me something. Go ahead, please. Someone was calling my name. All right. I, I was I was the only 